in? It depends on sector, country, time frame, but it's an, roughly twice as profitable, grow at twice the rate. It varies by study, but it's that order of magnitude. It's not 1%, 2% more. It's very significant improvements in many cases. So even getting it half right is very valuable. Okay? Okay. That's a pretty crowded slide. I'd like you to take maybe one or two things from that. This is another one of these stylized facts. What do we know about innovation? Well, quite a lot over 30 years of research. It's roughly how long people have been looking at this seriously. But I think there's a couple of things that are relevant today. Um, one thing is that the returns from new technology, that's one type of innovation that some of you are already thinking about because you come from an engineer and IT background. So the returns from applying technology are significantly greater than from developing it. It's not very inspirational, is it? Yeah? <laughs> if everyone adopted that, then I guess we get no new technology. But why do you think that might be? And it's not intuitive. I go to lots of companies, lots of organisations who spend a lot of time and effort reinventing technologies or slightly improving them, and the paybacks are low to zero, or negative in many cases. Yeah? They'd be better off actually looking to see what's around and trying to figure out how they could adapt it. That's not as exciting. You don't get your talent fired up on that. Yeah? So why do you think that might be? Why do you think often the application is where the interesting thing is? And that's not a neutral thing. You don't write a check and buy a piece of kit and apply it. There's a lot of clever stuff going on about who's doing what, how can we fit it together, how can we change it, adapt it, apply it, extract value from it. That's innovation. Yeah. I think if the technology exists or the innovation exists, yeah. then you, you can concentrate on how you carry it to produce a better outcome. Yeah. Whereas if, if it doesn't exist, hmm. you don't know what you're going to end up with. Yeah. You can end up with new technology or great concept that, that has no commercial value at all. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you get it right, it reduces potentially both cost and risk. Okay, again, it's not neutral. You don't just write a check. You've got to search it and find it. Yeah? And then you've got often to do a negotiation, a deal, sometimes intellectual property, sometimes a license, sometimes a relationship, a joint venture. Then you need to adapt, internalize it, add to it, and then create something from it. So this is not trivial. Okay? It's not trivial. But that's different to spending lots of time and resource to generating technology and then figuring out what you do with it. Okay? So perhaps less emphasis on generation and more emphasis on search, who's doing what, what could be used, and adaptation. Okay? I'll give you an example. Um, Nintendo. Nintendo's not doing so well at the moment, but the Nintendo Wii was, for about seven, eight years, the most profitable console and game combination ever. Yeah? Often they had that sort of razor blade model where they sell the consoles below price and then they get you on the, on the games and such like. But Nintendo make money both on the consoles and the games, and they reach new gamers. And that's an interesting story on its own, but it's not the story today. But what they're really smart at is when they were following the likes of Microsoft and Sony, is that rather than trying to invent technology that was better than those two companies, because it couldn't, it's a hundredth the size of those two companies in terms of capitalization. It couldn't compete on resources. So it's trying to figure out how can we do something different. So one smart thing was identifying non-gamers, but the other smart thing is where they acquired their technology. So the original Nintendo Wii, those who've got kids or are childish, what was the main technical innovation? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was the interface, wasn't it? The controller, if you like, yeah? And that was one of the major technological developments, but it wasn't a breakthrough. They didn't spend one penny of R&D on that. Okay, they searched around and thought, we can't outspend Sony, we can't outspend Microsoft, but we need a new, more intuitive interface for the non-gamers. What can we do? And they were looking around, searching around. And they ended up looking in another country, in another sector, and doing a deal. They looked in the automotive sector, in the US, on the West Coast. And they did a deal with analog devices, and they bought the chipsets, which are used in airbags, for a few cents each. And they adapted them in a controller, and the rest, as we say, is history. So that technology combined with clever segmentation, non-gamers, yeah, that's a great example of doing things innovatively. Okay? Not just about generation, it's about adaptation and search. Okay? Okay. Um, so maybe less of generation and more of the searching what's out there already and how could we adapt it and how can we internalize it and, and create value. And we'll come back to that again and again. Uh, the other one here is this issue of process innovation. If we start to expand our vocabulary, most of us, when we talk about innovation, think about either technology, 
if that's our background. I tend to do that. Or, or and or, shiny things. Yeah, shiny, shiny things like we do in marketing. Products. Products and services. Yeah, people like products and services. Everybody likes products and services, especially new ones. So often innovation collapses into products, particularly new products. Yeah, you go into companies, you say, I want to do some research and innovation, and say, ah, oh, product development. It's really exciting. Okay? But you look at the evidence, and the returns to process innovation are two, three, sometimes four times that on product innovation. And yet, companies learn very little on process innovation. <coughs> and it drives you crazy. So again, our argument is, once you expand the types of innovation, understand how they work and how they contribute, you can do smarter things. So why do you think, two questions for you. Why do you think we get so seduced by product development, which is important when we can look at a case study of product development. It is important, but it's probably not as important as process innovation. So my first question, why are we so seduced by product innovation? And flowing from that is, really, why is process innovation so much higher return? So let's start with the first. Why? As a product, a new product imply a relationship. We all are consumers and we like very much to establish a relationship with a new product. Mm -hmm. As when we meet a new person about processes, above, above, above all about reducing costs. Yeah. One of the so, so, one, so, one, so one is the idea a product is more externalized, it's more tangible. Maybe a means of exchange. Yeah, look at my new phone. Yeah, it's shiny. Look, shiny phone. Yeah. So certainly that's one of the characteristics. And don't underestimate that in terms of getting resources for funding. Yeah. I think sometimes there's a failure to recognise that, that what you've already done, um, there's more profitability in it. I think people maybe it's an arrogant sort of place that you think you've got X, Y, Z products. Yeah. So you've done that. So the, the way we can expand is by getting something new. Yeah. Without looking. Yeah, no, I think that's true. If you look at product life cycles models, often companies use product life cycle models not just to manage their products, but to manage their people. So they move all their smart people onto the next product before they've completely uh, debugged the existing one, yeah, and milked different segments. So you're dead right in terms of it. Tends to people get, lose interest. I think it's not arrogance. They lose interest, go on to the next shiny thing, yeah, because that's where you get the kudos. It's out there. It's in the external world. Yeah, you can win awards. Competitors can look at it. Peers can look at it. Yeah, you can demonstrate it. Tell people what you're working on. It's, uh, it's sexy to have a new product to come in and you can just say, this solves your problems. Um, and, and that does, in and of itself doesn't require any real human behavior changes. Whereas process, a new process, uh, will require changing your culture, your process. It, it, it's much deeper to, to get into that field. So in a way, it actually could be more difficult, too, in terms of uh, adoption and adapting. Yeah, and certainly the case, particularly in business to business environments, people often rather sign a check and buy a piece of kit, which almost never works. Mm -hmm. and think, I've done it, I've got it. Look, look at the lights, look, it's fantastic. Uh, one of my earlier jobs was taking managers around for the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry. And we used to have these study missions overseas. And one of them, we went to Japan. And we went to Japan when it's at its height of, uh, in terms of its uh, competitiveness before all the um, stagflation and such like the last decade and a half. Okay? And we were looking at not only the leading Japanese companies, but the um, Demim winners, so the creme de la creme in terms of quality management. And we spent 10 days and, on briefing and debriefing before and after. And still, two-thirds of those managers from Europe came back and said, we got better technology than them. Well, congratulations, but you got worse vehicles. You've got worse products. <laughs> yeah? We've got more modern machines than them. Congratulations. Yeah? You have a checkbook. Um, but they miss the process stuff, so it's harder to see, harder to implement, you're dead right. And, and that's another, another issue. But let's flip that in terms of the process. Why do you think then that process innovation is so much more um, higher return? Yeah. I would say process means making your value chain more efficient, yeah. hence business more, more efficient. And that drives long-term competitive advantage, drives uh, profitability in the long term, and, and gives you the say, the, the head of the companies. Okay. Couple of things, well, a couple of things there at least. One is it's more entrenched, yeah? yeah? And flowing from that, it's harder to imitate. Yeah. yeah, shiny new product comes out. What happens with a shiny new product? Cell phone, car, what happens is your competitors buy a dozen of them, reverse engineer and say, how do they do that? Is there anything <coughs> new here? Who are their suppliers? Do we want to emulate it? Can we emulate it? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, yeah? But it's more expensive to emulate the whole value chain. 
much harder, yeah, to look at the systemic, how do they do it? So, sometimes you benchmark, you think, how do they do it? You benchmark the metrics, you say, they can't do it, it must be dumping. And you go to the EU and say, they're dumping stuff on us. And then they take you to the factories and say, well, actually, this is how we do it. Yeah? And we're an order of magnitude better than you are. So, okay? uh, would you consider iPhone's big success uh, in other cases here? Because they made an improvement in the existing product. Yeah. Right now they are uh, big, huge. It's, uh, today, I'd rather. <laughs> it's a good question about the iPhone. I won't get into Apple and the iPhone today. Simple reason, it's, it's a bit like religion and football. It tends to divide people, and it's too early for us to fight, OK? <laughs> it, remind me in the last session, and I'll give you my opinion. But it's not good in the first session, because it divides people too much. Uh, not, quite, you know, not quite as bad as religion, maybe, but certainly better than football. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a very good example. More about process. So why do you think? So one is it's more entrenched, and it's harder to imitate as a result of that. What other benefits? I think the, the advantage of process innovation is around uh, the fact that this is the result of what you've been doing over time. Mm. You've actually identified the waste, what didn't work, and then you're able to um, evolve and see more efficiently of using resources and meeting client needs, whatever it's business or individual. Yeah. And that way it becomes something that is native to your environment. And that way you, which is native to you, it is not native to the other company. So you struggle to copy you and do exactly what you do. Yeah, exactly that. What they call in the trade, the jargon, tacit knowledge. Tacit knowledge is stuff that you get by trial and error experience, things going wrong, you're learning from them. Process in particular is often characterised of that. Get it working properly, embedded, well, takes time and effort, yeah? Sometimes luck, okay? And that's a very important, and it's partly about the lack of limitation, but it also means it's more sustainable as a source of competitive advantage. And I'll give you an example, a slightly jingoistic one. We have three sessions together, so I'll get to offending every single nation, including my own. Um, the, the original float glass, you know, making big glass on, on zinc, molten zinc. So, you know, Pilkington patented the float glass, but it didn't make any money from the patents. It made money from installing the plants and making them work. And it would take two to three years to install a plant and actually make it work, because okay, that's tacit knowledge. It's not just, you can use my technology. I have to come here and build the plant for you. The French, I apologize. Very jingoistic statement. The French said, we don't want to license it from this British company. Why should we do it? We have the finest scientists in Europe. And so they had a royal commission to duplicate the Pilkington process. Twelve years later, they bought the licenses from Pilkington. So they couldn't <laughs> do it. Okay? It's tacit knowledge, trial and error, experience. Okay? Now, some aren't that extreme, decades of trial and error. But some, even IT systems, yeah? there's a lot of experiential learning. And that's hard to replicate quickly. Okay, so processes are harder to imitate, yeah? And they also have that ability to be more sustainable as a result over time. It's harder to reverse engineer and replicate. Okay? Any other reasons why you think process innovation has high ut utility? Uh, I think process innovation can ripple through different products. That's the products. Yeah. So your know, new product is specific to that product. Yeah, exactly that. It's often, if you didn't hear it, it's sort of, it can be um, applied if you're an operations guy, across a whole range of different products quite often, or services. Or if you're an accounting guy, you can sort of you know, allocate the fixed costs across lots of products <coughs> and services. So you could argue, I know you've, um, I think you've done a case on Amazon with Mike, uh, you could argue that one of the clever things Amazon's done, there are many others, and then some other things that aren't so smart, um, is to have the basic platform in terms of its billing system and its logistics and its warehousing, and then pump more and more things through that, more and more products and services. Okay. And that's largely a process innovation, or a set of process innovations interacting, and then figuring out what can we put through that next. And that's smart. Okay? So a couple of things so far from that slide. One is that often the smart application, you know, don't deride what we call imitation or adaptation. It's massively undervalued. Yeah? We get so proud about reinventing things, and often it's not a very smart thing to do. It's better to search adapt often from different sectors or countries and apply it in a whole different way. And we'll talk about that later. Very important. And the second thing is how important process innovation is. Okay? Undervalued significantly. And the last thing on that slide, that busy slide there, is thank goodness, because you guys are doing an MBA, um, otherwise it would be a bit pointless, is that management does make a measurable difference. That's the good news. The bad news is it's really hard to measure what contribution it is. Yeah? Because it's hard to measure management <coughs> of innovation. So people try to put metrics on and questionnaires and such like. 
And it varies. Sometimes it's quite small, 10, 15%. Sometimes it's quite a big chunk. Half the performance can be attributed to better management and coordination. Okay? But sometimes it's hard to unravel that from process innovation. Okay? So I'm going to argue that based on the experience and evidence of roughly 30 years of work, <laughs> not my own, other people's, um, is that process innovation, search, adaptation, imitation, call it what you will, and therefore the management of those things, coordination of the thing, is where, where the value is. Okay? And that's not necessarily intuitive. Because we tend to think either it's about technology or it's about product development. And those two things are very important, as we'll see, but they're not often not that central. Okay? Okay.